can be given subcutaneously um, up to twice a day, but um, these drugs are not orally administered. Okay. Now the low molecular weight heparins are kind of like that second generation group that I was talking about. Um, they offer really um, better um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties. Okay. And the selectivity in terms of these drugs on um, heparin, I'm sorry, on, on um, thrombin and factor 10A is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, anywhere from 2 to 1 to 4 to 1 in terms of their ability to block thrombin to factor 10A. Um, they completely inactivate 10A, but they only inactivate um, thrombin by uh, one quarter to 50%. Okay. And so those preparations include anoxaparin. Um, you've probably heard of the brand name Lovenox. Um, Deltaparin um, under the brand name Fragmin. Um, I've, never, I've heard of Tenazaparin. I've never heard of this brand name. And I've never heard of this brand name either. Um, I think Lovenox is probably the more commonly encountered um, brand name low molecular weight heparin, at least on the Rush formulary. Okay, and so these low molecular weight heparins are um, structurally a little bit smaller, um, and this is probably the the largest of the molecules that are low molecular weight heparins, and this is probably the smallest. Um, but the concept is the same, and so here you've got your factor ten, um, factor ten A rather, and your antithrombin, and um, this this molecule doesn't completely engulf. Um, the whole complex like heparins, like the unfractionated heparins did. But the concept is essentially the same. Um, these two endogenous proteins um, want to bind. They have affinity for each other. And all this molecule does is it lowers the energy threshold, acting kind of like a catalyst, and facilitates the binding. So it increases the affinity. Okay, And so that, that same relationship exists here um, in terms of both factor 10A and antithrombin. Um, and then this particular diagram doesn't have it, but the same also exists, although to much lower incidence in terms of um, antithrombin binding to um, thrombin, which is factor 2A. <clears throat> okay, so we'll use uh, low molecular weight heparins um, during coronary artery, um, I'm sorry, coronary, yeah, coronary artery balloon angioplasty. Um, during the stent placement procedure, and we're, we're doing this to prevent thrombosis, okay? Um, there's relatively very little platelet effects, okay? Remember, these platelets are um, intimately um, churning out um, thrombin, um, and here we're, we're, we, we see a much smaller um, uh, effect on thrombin. We see a more um, beneficial effect. Most of the affinity um, in terms of these drugs is really kind of geared towards factor 10a, which is kind of the end of the cascade. Um, <coughs> I alluded to earlier that a lot of these low molecular weight heparins have kind of uh, pharmacokinetic advantages. Um, we can give them subcutaneously um, once or twice a day. This is in contrast to um, unfractionated heparin, which would be in an IV bag and then dripping essentially kind of continuously. Um, and in terms of dosing, we can we can give fixed, do, uh, fixed adjusted doses or, or weight adjusted doses, dosages. Um, and we don't have to really monitor coagulation. And we'll talk about patient monitoring a little bit later towards the end of this lecture. Um, but understand that you know, there are, um, uh, there are uh, monitoring um, assays out there that essentially look at how, how strong the coagulation cascade is being inhibited with some of these drugs. Okay, I like this diagram. Let me move the slide over a little bit. Um, I like this diagram because what it does is it essentially shows you the difference between heparins, low molecular weight heparins, and the synthetic heparins, Vondaparinux, which is um, described here, and the molecular target. And so, you know, heparin has the highest affinity to both factor 10 and factor 2. Low molecular weight heparin has a much greater affinity to factor 10 and moderate affinity to factor 2, but you know, still present nonetheless. And Fondaparinex is only associated with inhib inhibition of factor 10A. Okay. Heparins have a complete antidote effect, 
low molecular weight heparins have a partial antidote effect, and so that's again referring to uh, protamine sulfate. Bondoparinux um, has has no um, antidote effect, and the incidence of thrombocytopenia is the highest in heparins, which and again these are the, the unfractionated heparins, and lowest in the low molecular weight heparins. All right. And so just to remember, you know, factor 10 is important, um, too. We've been talking about, you know, the importance of, of molecularly inhibiting both factor 10 and factor 2. Uh, Fondoparinux, which, remember, recall, only inhibits factor 10A, um, this is a viable um, pharmacologic target as well, um, because factor 10A is really kind of responsible for the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin. And by basically reducing the activity of factor 10A, you're basically kind of um, inhibiting the uh, rate-dependent um, step in terms of thrombin activity. And so a good example of other factor uh, 10A inhibitors include rivaroxaban, also known as Xarelto. Okay, And so um, this is a little bit different than Fondoparinox. Fondoparinox is a heparin-like molecule. Okay. Uh, Rivaroxaban is a little bit of a different um, molecule. It's a, it, it's an actual um, it's an actual chemical. It's it's not protein in nature. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Right now, rivaroxaban is an indicated for atrial fibrillation as well as prophylaxis of um, DVTs after knee or hip replacements. Okay, so here's the dosing guidelines for um, prophylaxis for those for those um, orthopedic type surgeries, and then here's the dosing guideline for atrial fibrillation. So obviously this drug is going to be dependent upon creatinine clearance. Okay, and so obviously patients with you know really really poor kidney function and atrial fibrillation could not use um, Sorelto or rivaroxaban, um, and they'd be more inclined to use probably the um, uh, some of the uh, low molecular weight heparins that we talked about in the previous um, previous presentation. Um, lots of drug-drug interactions. Um, there's a P glycoprotein as well as a CYP3A4 known interaction, um, and then there's a, <coughs> excuse me. There's some well-known drug-drug um, interactions that we'll go through and consolidate um, later on in this curriculum. Aliquis is another um, brand name for the um, apixaban uh, molecule, which is another um, inhibitor of factor 10A. Um, like some of the other factor 10A inhibitors, there's really no direct effect on the existing platelets. Okay, and this drug can be orally administered, which is which is convenient. Um, and here we're using it for the reduction in stroke and systemic embolism in patients that have a non-valve atrial fibrillation. Okay, and we've also extended this um, to DVT prevention in terms of patients that have um, that are undergoing knee and or hip replacement surgery. And so the next group of drugs are your your direct inhibitors of thrombin. And so we said thrombin was such a key essential um, player that we actually made a group of drugs that go after thrombin itself. Okay. Um, and so the first group we'll talk about are, so these are these are drugs that directly interact with and inactivate free thrombin. So again, factor 2A, as well as thrombin that's already interacted with fibrin. So these are, now these this is thrombin that's basically associated with a clot. Okay, and so at this point we're, we're going to the, uh, a site of active clot formation, and we're severely restricting the the, the pro-clotting ability of thrombin, okay? And so it will directly and reversibly um, inhibit factor 2A, which is thrombin, at the active site, okay? And there's a few drugs that are out there. Um, they can be further subdivided into their chemistry based on where the binding site is. Uh, this is just background. I don't know if this is extremely clinically relevant, but it's interesting. Um, the bivalent direct thrombin inhibitors bind to both the active site and another site called the exocyte. <clears throat> and the main drug probably that uh, you, you would more likely to be in, uh, encounter clinically is bivalirudin. Um, and so these drugs are actually um, 
derived from um, the, the, the medicinal leech. Um, this is in contrast to the univalents, which just bind to the active sites, and so these are your gatrobands. So R gatroband, DAB gatroband. Um, the, the, the older term, or the, uh, the term that was used maybe just in the last seven or eight years, uh, these, these drugs are called the novel oral anticoagulants, and so they're, they're not really novel anymore. Um, they're the newest, uh, but they're, they're not novel. They've been used in the clinic for quite some time. So dabagatrin um, has really like the first oral direct thrombin inhibitor. It was on the market back in 2009. And it's, you know, and the reason we're talking about it here is that it got approval for atrial fibrillation um, that's not caused by any kind of valve malfunction. Okay. And again, the dosing guidelines are um, or, or suggest a, a renal elimination component. And um, there are some drug-drug interactions in terms of CYP enzyme systems as well as peak glycoprotein inhibition. Okay. Dabigatrin, um, pharmacokinetics and dynamics. Um, remember, we said it was orally administered. Um, the bioavailability is quite small. It's only 3 to maybe 7%. Um, the maximal plasma concentration is reached within one hour after administration. Um, and the half-life, however, is uh, anywhere from 12 to 17 hours. And so we see renal elimination of this drug. Our gatchaban, which is shown here, is a small molecule anticoagulant. Um, and it's really used as kind of an alternative um, to patients that, that, um, that would, would use something like one of the rudins for prophylaxis. Um, uh, and then we've also got a, a little bit of a subtype in terms of um, patients that are at risk of developing HIT or have a history of developing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and are undergoing PCI. So it's kind of like sitting there on the shelf reserved for these kind of special cases. Okay. And the last group of drugs that are clinically significant